you were the first person to successfully separate uh, co-joined twins. Can you give us sort of a brief synopsis as to what, a, what, what even gave you the idea sure. that that was possible? Well, uh, I was the first one, uh, along with my team, to separate typed. Um, these, these are called occipital craniopagus twins, joined at the back of the head. And the reason it's so complex is because the vasculature is very, very complicated, and they generally bleed to death. Well, I had gotten interested in the whole concept of conjoined twins for some strange reason. It just fascinated me, and I started reading a lot of the literature, trying to figure out why the results were so dismal with attempted separations, and concluded that it was exsanguination or bleeding of death. And I was talking to a good buddy of mine who was the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Johns Hopkins, and he had done a lot of work with hypothermic arrest where you cool the body temperature until the heart stops, pump all the blood out of the body, and then you can operate on a baby's heart up to an hour before you have to pump the blood back in, warm it up, and start the heart up again. And I was thinking, you know, if we got to a critical point in a separation, we could go on hypothermic arrest, get through all the complicated vasculature, and then restructure it, reconstruct it, and then pump the blood back in and start the heart up. And then I was saying, why am I thinking about this? I'm never going to see a set of twins like that. They're very rare. Lo and behold, two months later, here they came. Here came the German doctors presenting this case all over to major medical centers to see if anybody had a solution. Because in Europe, they were advocating to the mother that she choose which twin she wanted, and they would chop the other one off. And, you know, she couldn't come to that decision because she loved both of them. And uh, so I explained this ideal I had about using hypothermic arrest. Everybody said, whoa, that sounds like it might be good. And we sat down and we started putting together some plans. And, you know, I'm very much advantaged by, by being at a place like Johns Hopkins where you have a lot of incredibly smart people who know a lot about different things. And, uh, you know, we put our heads together and we came up with a plan. And, uh, you know, the, the rest is history. Uh, d- did you have challenges to that effort? Were there people telling you that it, was, that it was too risky? I mean, you ultimately, you know, every time you open that skull, you know, you have the ultimate responsibility in your hand. Um, you know, I'm sure that if it is, you know, if it's similar to when I've had surgery, you actually sign off on papers that ultimately say, Should there be an accident, you know, the hospital is not to blame. So you carry the ultimate responsibility in that uh, in that operating room. Did you have any serious challenges to that effort? Uh, There, there are always naysayers. You know, I've faced that throughout my entire career. You know, when I started uh, doing operations on a contraplast, you know, I was criticized severely by many of the famous geneticists. You neurosurgeons are the ones who kill these patients. Now the operation that we proposed is standard throughout the world. You know, when I started doing hemispherectomies, there were a lot of people who were skeptics. Uh, You know, I got involved with a lot of very controversial tumor cases. You know, craniofacial stuff. You know, I don't sit there and and spend a whole lot of time thinking about critics because, you know, if you do that, you'll never get anything done. You know, I, I wrote a book called Take the Risk. And, you know, the basic premise is nobody really ever accomplishes anything by sitting under the olive tree waiting for good things to happen. You know, you've got to be out there. You've got to be pushing the envelope. You've got to be thinking. You've got to be using all the things that are available to you. And, uh, you know, that same thing applies to what's going on, you know, in our world. Uh, so, you know, that's why I'm not a shrinking violet when it comes to talking about things going on in our world. It doesn't do any good to cure the organism and then to put it back into an environment that is unhealthy.